Good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to see you all gathered here today for our panel. Uh, and uh, we gear up uh, to tackle the issue of global governance. This topic is uh, also more captivating in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has forced us uh, to reconsider our own individual reasons, uh, relationship uh, to both, uh, no concept, and to everything we had previously thought uh, normal or uh, commonplace. Uh, I am pleased uh, to have uh, alongside me a number of friends and collaborators, the Institute for Advanced Study in uh, Labour Culture and Civilization for this panel, and I extend a warm thank you and uh, a hello uh, to um, Professor Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia University, the director of the United Nations Center for Sustainable Development. We are waiting. Uh, Professor Luisa Spiru of the Carlo Davila University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Bucharest, the president of uh, the Anna Aslan International Foundation. Uh, Dr. Ismail Saladjin, the co chair of the Nizami Gajab International Center a fellow of the World Academy of Art of Science and former vice president of the World Bank uh, uh, between 1992 and 2000. Uh, Professor Remus Bricopie, a rector of the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration in Bucharest and uh, uh, fellow of the World Academy of Art of Science. Uh, Professor uh, Laszlo Borbeli of the Babel Bolle University of Cluj Napoca, State Councillor for the Department of Sustainable Development of the Romanian Government, and uh, uh, a President uh, uh, of the uh, 19th Session of the United Nations Commission for Sustainable Development between 2010-2011. Uh, uh, I would also like to introduce Dr. Wana Brenda of the Tito Maionescu University of Bucharest, expert of the Institute for Advanced Study in Level Cultural Civilization, manager of the world post COVID 19 pandemic, a humanist vision for sustainable development project and, uh, project and co moderator of this panel. Uh, and, uh, and then also welcome uh, Gary Jacobs, uh, who is uh, with us. Uh, dear friends, Hi, over the following two hours, uh, I would cordially invite you to an uh, open discussion on how we can create an uh, efficient and effective strategy for global governments by uh, tackling several essential sectors, health, education, sustainable development, economics, uh, etc. Uh, since the uh, uh, panel we take uh, the form of an extensive uh, question and answer session, I would kindly ask uh, that you limit your replies to short uh, three to four minute intervals, uh, that we might cover uh, as uh, much ground and uh, as many examples of good uh, practice as possible. Uh, to begin uh, with, uh, I think uh, it is fair to say that the COVID-19 pandemic has sent a number of alarm bells ringing. Uh, issues such as, as uh, health, societal imbalances and their associated inequalities, uh, equitable access to resources, all of this uh, covered by uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals have uh, worsened following the, uh, the pandemic. And uh, given that this panel uh, shall focus on the role of academia in elaborating the vision of a strategy for global governance in the 21st century, I believe that the main goal of our debate is to achieve a better understanding of this concept, which has been given very bad definition so far. And therefore, I believe it is essential that we seek a definition from the very beginning of our discussion. And uh, now my first questions 
is for the doctor is my energy. Global governance cannot be achieved without intense uh, cooperation between all sectors of society. Dr. Ismail Seradegi, does the academic environment uh, have uh, something to contribute to the design and development of governance in the 21st century? Or uh, is this something dominated by politicians and power politics uh, between uh, nations? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. You yourself are a magnificent example of uh, uh, a leading academic who also is a political leader and uh, a thought leader in the world. Uh, but it was long said by the great uh, John Maynard Keynes himself, the practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, what we call practical wisdom and uh, common sense is uh, usually the result of what was thought and developed in the various academic institutions around the world. Uh, what is very clear right now is that uh, we are running uh, out of steam on the model that has dominated the world since the end of the Second World War the idea of the structured United Nations, but dominated by a group that have veto power on the Security Council. The idea of, yes, multilateralism, but also a hegemonic power. And uh, we went through the difficult period of the Cold War and where many of the countries tried to develop techniques so that we, they didn't have to choose between the Soviet Union and the, the uh, United States and the West. So we are now reaching a stage where it is clear that the old alliances of 75 years ago are in, in movement and uh, where China is rising, where there will be a, a multilateral world of a new order done. But there's also a, a, a backlash of nationalism. And who else other than the intellectuals who are housed in academia most of the time can challenge that and reassert our common humanity. We had gone a long way by 2015, but we are witnessing a return of uh, populism and nationalism. We are witnessing a disengagement even from the WHO in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and therefore I think we need to reassert the principles that gave us the, the Sustainable Development Goals, that gave us the Paris Accords, that gave us a belief in the fundamental human rights and to design new instruments, especially on the economic side, which I can tell, talk more about, uh, because many of the poorest countries are going to have a huge setback as a result of the COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ismail, um, on the t topic of uh, sustainable development, I uh, would like to point out that uh, Mr. Laszlo Borbeli is currently a state councillor for the Sustainable Development Department within the Romanian government. Um, Mr. Borbeli, could you tell us uh, how decision-making factors can uh, constitute uh, a catalyst for sustainable uh, development. What has uh, been done uh, until now at the state level to achieve the United Nations Sustainable uh, Development uh, uh, Goals? Uh, good evening and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important panel. And I am honored to be here. Uh, as I suppose I am the only representative of the uh, state in this moment, in this panel. I had the chance to uh, chair the last uh, CSD-19 uh, on the level of United Nations between 2010 and 2011. And I realized at that time how important are the two important pillars 
of the uh, development. One, science and all this part of academic area, and second, the political willingness. Because on that time, it was five very important and technical declarations prepared by two years by brilliant technicians regarding chemicals, regarding uh, waste management, regarding mining, regarding sustainable transport, regarding consumption uh, and production, sustainable consumption and production. And in one day, because of political debates, Osama bin Laden was killed just by this, uh, this period between G77, United States and Israel. In one day, they reject all five declarations. So we cannot uh, go forward without a leadership, which is a positive, which has a positive approach regarding these principles. And of course, the science and uh, uh, the know-how of those who are uh, working on this. And in 2016, I succeed to pass to the Romanian, uh, Romanian parliament without any vote against or abstention, a very important political declaration regarding the implementation of Agenda 2030. Uh, after that, we implement First of all, we established a department near the prime minister's office. It's very important to have a coordination office. Those who are capable to offer for the politicians the preparation of decisions, economic, social, and environmental. Step by step, we finalized a new strategy for Romania in sustainable development. We established an interministerial committee, which will have, I hope, in a couple of days, the second meeting, which all the ministers are there, and the prime minister is the president of this body. Why it's important on this very tough period of COVID-19? And in my opinion, we have no, as soon as possible, a post-COVID-19 era. We will have a COVID era, unfortunately, because it will not disappear. We have to live with this, but we have to prepare ourselves physically, of course, regarding our health, our physical mental system, how we approach on this to have a normal life and to prepare our economies. And that's why now, not just on the level of European Union, but we are speaking about global governance. Everybody has to understand that we need more action for a circular economy, more action to transform all the decisions in a neutral carbon world. And that's why it's Green Deal very important to implement on the level of European Union a new approach of the European semester and parallelly to have a very tough dialogue with academic area. And that's why I am very pleased that we have here uh, uh, those who are uh, involved in academic area because we had two uh, very important meetings with all the universities. We have now a map of how in universities they are teaching sustainable development agenda 2030, holistically speaking. And we have to work together. We will have a consultative council near the government, 34 very well prepared people, uh, personalities from different areas. So we have to put together uh, leadership, political willingness, uh, very well prepared scientists, and all stakeholders to have their input in creating based on these basic principles of ethical and other very well known uh, basic principles of a society, how we can put together a better world. But it's very difficult when we are seeing how uh, they are 
very, very uh, uh, important movements on the world. We have autocratic leaders. We have some very negative approach on this field. So we are prepared. Romania is a regional hub in this moment regarding uh, uh, sustainable development, but now will be the big challenge for us, for the politicians to put in place what we have, holistically speaking, in our mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Borbedi, for uh, bringing up uh, uh, global uh, uh, governance. And given that this panel uh, shall focus on the um, role of academia in uh, elaborating a vision and strategy for global governance in the 21st uh, century, I believe uh, that the main goal of our debate is to achieve a better understanding of this concept, uh, which have uh, been given very vague definition uh, uh, so far. Mm -hmm. Uh, the pandemic uh, has forced most countries to institute a shutdown of their economic activity at the enormous uh, local and global cost. Dr. Ismail Seradirgin, uh, given your expertise as Vice President of the World Bank, do you see in this feasible and realistic opportunity to design bespoke stimulus packages that can also help the poor internationally and move us towards a more um, sustainable development strategy? Well, I, I'm very glad that you are uh, raising this question, uh, Mr. Chairman, because actually uh, it is a, an important opportunity to think about this. The reason I say that is because of the magnitude of the uh, impacts that we are witnessing. Uh, the numbers are almost beyond belief. If you think about what's happened in the United States in the last uh, few months, uh, we have had uh, almost 40 million Americans uh, uh, losing their jobs. Uh, we've had uh, a very large number of them, in fact, uh, going on unemployment uh, as a result of the lockdown. And the stimulus package was over three trillion dollars, three trillion dollars. I mean, these are numbers that uh, dwarf uh, any expectation that any of us could have had uh, for uh, uh, spending on any programs that you could think of for the poor or otherwise. Unfortunately, the design of these programs have not been very good. Uh, yes, uh, people said we had to act very quickly and therefore, you know, the, get the money uh, through the door quickly to try to keep people afloat. Uh, but the net result of that is that you have a huge number of people who are queuing up at food banks in America. In America, they're queuing up at food banks like we used to see during the Great Depression uh, of the 1930s. So the design of the, of the stimulus packages, whether in America or in, in, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, can be designed much better than uh, I think they are in order not only to try to maintain the status quo, but in fact, to anticipate the changes that will come. And as a result, to reach out and include in the decision-making, include in the beneficiaries, people who are currently being marginalized by these systems and people who are not sufficiently there. Now, having said that, we are here in a global session. And in a global session, we have a major, major problem that many of the developing countries, the poorest countries, have even, don't even have the basic infrastructure to cope with the, the COVID-19 pandemic on top of which there will be disruptions in the supply chains for food. And on top of that, and this is something that global leadership is required, absolutely required for, there is a huge debt repayment structure that is built in 
where these poorest countries are supposed to pay back debt uh, uh, that they, on, on previous development loans that they've received, at least 44 billion out of sub-Saharan Africa alone. So you're looking at a, a very big problem and uh, just postponing it by six months, that is not real leadership. What we need is imaginative leadership that will, and, and here the academia can provide ideas and models and instruments. Um, for example, the, the Arrow de Bre, Kenneth Arrow and Gerard de Bre are both Nobel laureates in economics, have designed instruments that could be of interest right now. Uh, people like Joseph Stiglitz, who's now back in the academic world, and others have ideas about how we can, in fact, restructure that. Without having all this money passed on, staying in the banks, sloshing around, resulting in greater volatility in the stock market, but not benefiting the poor. So how do you design that? Here is where the best minds in the academic world can come to help. That's what great minds in the academic world like uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes in the last century, when he said governments have to step in. The business cycle is not foregone. We have to, to, to change. And he saw and foresaw that that's what we need right now, imaginative proposals to come in or else we'll be just pushing in front of us a huge set of problems that will undermine the 2030 agenda, the sustainable development agenda, will uh, bring back a, a new debt crisis and will push back a number of hundreds of millions of people back into extreme poverty. So that challenge is a challenge for the intellectuals of the world. And I think that we are happy that the uh, World Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences and the, the NGIC are working on these kinds of issues. Thank you. Uh, uh, we are already have uh, some uh, some comments. Thank you, Thank you. President Constantinescu. Uh, we already have uh, related to Dr. Sarah Geldin's um, comments. We have some ideas brought up by the attendees who are uh, looking at this uh, at this debate, uh, and uh, all of the opinions brought together so far focus on the fact on, on uh, what you already pointed that we need to be innovative in this in the manner in which we need to tackle uh, economics from now on because uh, the crisis. Uh, uh, pointed out that we are insufficiently prepared. That is one of the comments uh, already brought to our attention on the on this webinar's uh, chat. Uh, the fact that the crisis. Um, re requires a way to lead globally, which is still possible even right now as we're still in mid-crisis and post-crisis in order to be able to deal with the future um, future crisis. Uh, and also in order to ensure that uh, future crisis, should they also occur, uh, one of uh, the, the um, comments brought to our attention by Yehuda Kahane says that uh, we need to work on that if um, because if two thirds Thirds of the workers were still employed dealing with this uh, pandemic, uh, the economic harm would have been reduced, the injury to production workers and students would have been minimal. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Dr. Sarah Gelden, for pointing out the need of innovation, the need of innovative thinking in economic, uh, in an economic perspective in order to, to deal with the, uh, this situation. I give the floor back to, to President Constantinescu and to the other uh, panelists. Thank you. Um, Health care is a key concern for the, for the SDGs and the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that even the most effective health care system are powerless before a new and uh, unknown enemy. Uh, Dr. Luisa Spiro, uh, given the pandemic uh, has shown um, a spotlight uh, on the vulnerability of the elderly. How must we rethink uh, our impression of uh, longevity in this context, uh, speaking both of our chronological and biological age? Uh, what is uh, your impression of uh, assistive technologies for independent aging? And uh, 
what are the opportunities and the challenges uh, they entail? President, and uh, uh, good evening to all your guests and uh, congratulations for this uh, magnificent event. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity of, uh, of speaking among your, um, your, uh, your guests about health, about new concepts, about uh, uh, what is the vulnerable population during this uh, pandemia and post-pandemia, let's see, and what is the relation with, uh, with longevity. Um, first of all, First of all, we do not um, we do not uh, uh, speak about uh, about elderly population because we do not use uh, during the last two years uh, these words because a society, as you know, is measured by how it cares for its older citizens. This is this is the statement um, declared by by the World who, uh, World uh, World Organization in two thousand nineteen. Regarding then the, about the COVID pandemic. Uh, 19 that has been accentuated the exclusion and of uh, of the of the older adults as we call them we call them older adults and not only seniors or elderly population and um, this current crisis highlights a disturbing public discourse about about the aging and there are so many questions about the value of the older adults lives and disregards their valuable contribution for the for the society uh, meanwhile, you are. Um, meanwhile, you are. You are um, asking about um, about longevity, and how longevity can uh, um, is influenced about this uh, this pandemic. As probably some of you knows that there is a there is a very famous study published in two thousand nineteen in early two thousand nineteen about longevity and about the main pillars of it. And um, these pillars are mentioning the most important criteria for longevity, actually. The first one is the brain health. The second one is a good diet. The third one is the physical activity. And the fourth one is the spiritual life. And um, uh, here we can talk a lot about what longevity means, in fact. Um, it's and when we speak about longevity, I, I, I think I have, a, I have a fluctuation for my internet. I don't know if there is, do you hear me? Do you yes, hear me? we can hear you okay. very well. Okay. Please continue. Okay, okay sorry. Okay. Um, so when we speak about longevity, this is a very important, this is a very, very important thing. Uh, and uh, during this pandemic, we had so many problems uh, by uh, and misinterpretations of COVID-19 as an older adult problem, which is something which is something very unpleasant because many countries have chosen to impose stricter restrictions of an older over the older adults, ordering them to remain inside during the pandemic. All these restrictions uh, were exacerbating the long-standing problem of the older adults' isolation, and uh, while restrictions may aim to be protective, such policies have often translated into patronizing public communication, depicting all other adults and vulnerable members of the, of the society. What I would like to, what I would like to, um, uh, to highlight is that, as you know for sure today, the younger adults are not immune to this virus and they share the responsibility for the spread of the virus. We have to understand, all the society have to understand that because, because uh, some of us, can become vector, can become vectors for the for the for the older adults, but um, uh, COVID nineteen is also not a disease only of the elder adults, and these effects will be felt by uh, by everyone, and uh, we all must do our part to uh, to curtail its uh, its spread. Um, I will I will speak later about this if I will have the opportunity about uh, the ageism, but I would also like to mention that. As you know, probably um, the older adults population all over the world actually is about uh, 700 million. In 2050, it will be about 1 billion point five. And don't forget that uh, uh, the older adults over 65 and over will be much more um, in, in the Eastern and Southeastern Asia. And uh, this largest increase 
it's also a very huge problem for the for the for the global uh, uh, policies. And um, these policies uh, in the area, of course, include those aimed at eliminating age barriers. So we do not believe in age barriers. And when we speak about biological and chronological age, this is this is uh, a strong barrier in our in our days because. Uh, um, us as professionals, we do not believe in, uh, in the chronological age, but mainly in the molecular and biological age, and also strongly believe in the financial age. And investing in education and health and well being for all, in uh, lifelong learning and technology, as we do a lot from uh, since the last 15 years, we can improve the quality and independent living of the older adults. Um, there is a need of um, more emphasis uh, to be placed also, also in this lifelong learning uh, to keep us with changing in technology and maintain flexibility in all, all, all the old adults, older adult skills. Uh, it's uh, very important when we speak about longevity to, to include technology as part of this research. And um, <clears throat> I cannot imagine today longevity and the brain health without the use of technology and innovation solution to promote uh, uh, lifelong and independent lifelong learning. Dr. Saradelgin, did you want to say something? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would like very much to follow up on uh, what uh, Luisa was saying. Uh, we have a, a, a problem that we inherited from the 1930s of, la of the last uh, uh, century. Uh, and this is uh, primarily that with enormous success, uh, we have extended life expectancy at birth by easily more than 20 years. Uh, so the net result is that a lot of the instruments that we had designed, including social security, including uh, uh, the notion that people would retire at age 60 or age 62 or maximum age 65 is no longer valid. Uh, people uh, used to uh, retire at, at those ages and die three, four, five years later. Now they live 20, 30 years more and they are very potentially very useful members of society. So I think that there is a, a real need to redesign not just the access to health services, not just the issues of whether nursing homes, isolations, et cetera, are valid or not, but the entire structure. Practically every country in the West today uh, has a bankrupt system of social security uh, in the sense that it was designed on young people coming in because the population pyramid was like that. So more young people were coming in and they were paying into, into it as they were in the productive years and a much smaller part would be the retirees who would draw on that. That is no longer valid. It's an opportunity to rethink the role of the elderly in society. It is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, lifelong learning, a lot of other things can be brought in and they can be brought in and, and this time it can be brought in with uh, a, um, uh, uh, the incentive that it will be economically viable solutions. We are designing economically more viable solutions than what we now have. So it's not a matter of just spending. It's a matter, in fact, of giving these people, the elderly, a productive role in society to the extent that we can uh, uh, get, match their uh, abilities and their requirements and uh, their desirabilities. Uh, that kind of thinking will come, Mr. President, it will come from academia, do not come from, from elsewhere. The design of financial instruments will also come from academia. I mentioned the, the, the uh, Arrow de Breu uh, securities as one of the examples, but there are many others. And the fine tuning of these instruments, I think are very important. Finally, I'll just raise one question to leave with you. Right now, we also need to rethink globalization in terms of what it means in terms of trade, because the old fashioned trade is now being challenged again as a result of the bad experience that people have had suddenly 
of finding that they can't produce something here because a piece of it is being produced in another country and it's not available, uh, whether it was for masks or for other things in America and so on. So I think we need uh, to see how we can seize the moment and have the, the academics come up with uh, new ideas and new solutions that they can present to the decision makers. And uh, Lazaro is right, sometimes they will reject the, all five proposals or <laughs> all 10 proposals, but other times they may accept. And gradually, when I used to be at the World Bank, I always told my colleagues, a no is a yes that needs more work. So when the, the, the politicians say no, we have to come back again, fine tune the proposals and push forward the ideas that we reach out for our, push forward the ideas that we reach out for our common humanity. Thank you. Uh, from healthcare, we now uh, turn to another critical field, education. Uh, Rector Remus Prikopje, where do you see university's contribution in um, addressing the current uh, COVID-19 crisis? Good evening, everyone. Thank you, President Constantinescu, for inviting me to this um, debate. Uh, very shortly, before to go directly to this uh, topic of COVID and universities, and fortunately we have many good examples of involvement, I would like to add uh, to the arguments of um, our colleagues already stated here, the role of um, academia and how I see and my colleagues here in the university, we see the role of academia in uh, implementing public policies and uh, in designing new model of governance. Uh, as we very well know, <clears throat> politics is done by politicians and is normal to be like this. It's a democratic uh, way because they have the legitimacy of the citizens by votes. However, politicians have different objectives in terms of um, um, their mandate. A mandate of a politician is four, five, six years. It depends on the political system. And sometimes they are looking to see concrete results within their mandates, if possible, tomorrow. I used to be Minister of Education, not as a politician. I was a specialist invited to sit in this political uh, position for two years. And I know the kind of dialogue that a cabinet uh, generally uh, has. However, we have issues which we cannot address in uh, two years, in four years. And uh, for example, let's discuss about um, um, education challenges, kids left behind, curriculum, and uh, you know, integration of these graduates on the labor market. Sometimes you decide something today and will have an impact in 10 years, depending on the educational cycle and the years of study for specific pupils. So this is the role of uh, academia to think bes bes beside the pressure of time and beside the pressure of votes and to try to give solutions for the country and not for a specific political win in a political campaign. Uh, and uh, also another aspect which I do believe we have to play a very important role is to try to translate in both directions, translate a specific topic, a specific policy to the politicians in order to persuade them to adopt specific measures, but also to translate the specific uh, proposal, policy proposal to uh, citizens, because our responsibility is not just to teach and to do research, to teach in front of our students. Sometimes we have to teach by doing public communication and to try to spread some concepts in the, for the public good, not for other uh, interests. And I do believe this example of COVID, it's a very good example of involvement of academia. If we are to count in Romania, for example, but also in other countries, the public speakers on COVID, you will find a lot of medical doctors, university professors doing their job in front of mass media and trying to send 
the, the message to educate the population how to avoid infection. And um, uh, so uh, another, and now I'm coming directly to your question. We have many, many examples here in Romania, but also I am aware of other examples in other countries and universities contributed with the identification of problem to understand exactly what's the risk, how this problem will develop in the in short, long uh, and, and long term. Also with medical analysis, for example, many universities in Romania, not necessarily medical university, including technical universities, use their equipment in order to identify the infected people based on a protocol developed in medical schools and in research institutes. So this happened, for example, in Suchava University, which is not a medical school, but working with a specialist, they were authorized to do this uh, testing. Also, uh, we can go further and uh, uh, say the university provided um, the basic research, fundamental research for the needed vaccine that, uh, you know, everyone, every prime minister, president is looking for in order to go in front of the citizens saying we succeeded. And again, we have many examples in, um, we have Oxford, we have a lot of many American universities, we have uh, Cluj Medical School, who is in this competition to uh, have a vaccine. And uh, also we have the prediction because no one knows what's going to happen. And practically, and that it's good, it's a good moment, good example to show how politicians practically follow, I would say 90% the advice of the specialist. In Romania, the president, the prime minister, the government, they said, based on the specialist opinion, we consider we have to do. So, it's, it's a very good example, even though the situation is bad, but I would like to see this very good example when, for example, the medical doctors and the specialists in uh, psychology, they say in order to have good results in education, let's start to, to follow the kid from the beginning when he's still not born. Let's monitor the mother. Let's monitor the, the healthy of the mother and of the kid. Let's start education at one year old. When I said as a minister of education, we have to put in the near future compulsory all kids at the age of three in kindergarten, many journalists started to criticize me saying, uh, this uh, idea is not a good one. It was not my idea. It was based on research prepared by specialists in Romania, but also around the world, the World Bank advice and many, many other sources, specialized sources. And I will conclude because President Constantinescu said, let's clarify the terms. So we use this term uh, global governance. What does it mean? It depends of uh, different people, but for me, it's clear it's not a unique cabinet ruling the world. This is not global, go global governance. For me, if I want, if I am to, to, to try to define, it's more a coherent approach. All the time you will have local, national, regional, uh, and global form of governance with different responsibilities. But what is important, and as a Minister of Education for two years, I tried and I, I think I succeeded to uh, approach different challenges this way. Okay, we have this issue, kids left behind. Is Romania the only country having this issue? Naturally not. Okay, let's see what the other countries have done. How they approach this? Let's have a comparative uh, view. And after that, when I go in front of the prime minister and in front of the public opinion saying, based on the comparative study with 103 countries, together with the World Bank, it's exactly my message at that moment, 
we put on the table the strategy to decrease uh, the number of kids uh, who are not able to succeed the school. So if you want to criticize, you can criticize me, but not for the idea, because all the ideas there are the ideas of dozens of specialists, Romanian and internationals. So this is a way to approach in a more, as I mentioned, coherent uh, way, never mind the, the, the issue, never mind the policy. And politicians, and I'll conclude, they have from time to time to listen more than they can imagine, to listen from the specialists. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for the time. We have uh, now another comment from uh, our viewers. Thank you, President Constantinescu. Uh, thank you, Rector Pricopia, for this comprehensive view on uh, tackling education and connecting it to decision makers and the need to transfer education, health related topics to um, uh, decision makers and uh, politicians to be able to elaborate strategies, long term strategies um, that could uh, identify problems and give the, pro the appropriate solutions. Going back to um, our uh, main topic, the idea of uh, the role of education, the role of academia. Uh, we have a question from Professor Rodika Toader. She's a mathematics professor at the University in Udine, and she would like to, to address this question. She would like you to address this question. During these months of lockdown, schools and universities moved online. So we had online education, as uh, Professor uh, Toader is writing. Do you think this will have an impact on education also after the pandemic? And uh, should academia take advantage of this huge effort to promote a broader access to education and if that is the case how should it be done thank you thank you thank you for the interest and for the question in my opinion the answer is yes we will never had the for the same system of education like in uh, 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 January 2020 many, many universities and even school. In fact, yesterday, the government put on the uh, web for public consultation, a new thinking of uh, opening the schools in, uh, in September, which will imply combining online and uh, in the classroom uh, classical education. It is what I, when I was a student in, um, in uh, Institute of Education in London, I learned for the first time the concept blended learning. That was 20 years ago. And I, 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 I didn't understand initially what does it mean, blended learning. So we'll do blended learning, including in my university in CNSFA, trying to heavily use the online instrument and the permanent connection with our students and also the classical uh, uh, interventions. And related to resources, yes, Education is also an issue related with resources, academic resources. There are many students, many pupils not having access uh, yeah, to internet, not having access to a computer or to a tablet. In my opinion, and uh, during this pandemic, we had different meetings, including with experts from UNESCO, UNICEF, World Bank, OECD. And I do believe soon the definition of compulsory education will be changed. And one of the condition is will be not just to have the pupil in the classroom, but also the pupil to have access to online resources, never mind where he or she is. Something which in Romania, somehow we started uh, eight years ago by introducing online textbooks the first country, we don't say this, unfortunately, but Romania was the first country putting all textbooks associated with a grade, at that moment, the first grade, online with free access for everyone. So now we have more than one year. We have, I think, uh, six or seven years of studies with all textbooks there. Uh, and we have to do the next step to provide each kid with a device in order to can access these uh, uh, resources. So to be short, because uh, I was not short <laughs> in my response, I do believe 
the future will be a blended learning system, never mind the country, never mind the kind of institution. Uh, thank you, uh, Rector uh, uh, Prikopje. Uh, Dr. Seradergin, uh, do you want to add something? Yes, I do. I, I want to speak specifically to this point that was raised. Yes, we will have a, a very different kind of educational system. It already had started. Uh, you know, MIT has had all its uh, courses online uh, for the last uh, 10, 12 years now. Uh, Khan Academy has uh, done a lot of uh, shorter uh, interventions. Coursera uh, and other Udacity and other uh, uh, online uh, learning from Stanford have had major impact. edX with Harvard and the Texas a &M and so on. So we have a lot of examples there of things that are happening, but they will be, I think, as uh, the, the, the uh, rector uh, Remus said, uh, part of a blended system. Uh, education is not the education that we think of in terms of, of uh, uh, 12 years of school or two years of kindergarten, 12 years of school, and then four or five years of university is not just about imparting skills. It is also very much about socialization. It is how it's unhealthy for children to be uh, devoid from contact with other children, each one staying home and uh, connecting with online and so on. But we can use online much more creatively uh, than it has been uh, used in the past but children need to be with other children of their own age. That's part of the socialization process. And especially in universities, from the end of high school to the end of university, this is when uh, young or, or, or growing children become independent uh, citizens. This is where they experiment uh, with their own health, uh, with uh, 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 forming households, with entering the labor market, with a lot of transformations, profound transformations that take place in every society. And the community that exists in a university allows them to experiment politically and otherwise until they come out as responsible citizens on the other side. So that function there will have to be found in a different way, I think, than it has been in the past. But I don't think that you will totally replace it with what we now have, as some people uh, imagine, which is people staying at home and trying to do everything online. We will do a lot more online, as in fact, in meetings. I suspect that the future of meetings will be, as we are doing right now, a lot more of this and a lot less of the old fashioned way, of, of which I used to love, of going to meet people and where we would go out for a cup of coffee and sit down for a lunch here and so on in the meetings themselves. But this is so convenient because you can pull people from all over the world for two hours and get a, a good interaction among them. And I think that that will also evolve on the other side. But please, let's not forget the socialization function of the school system and of the education system, not just the impartation of skills. Thank you, uh, Dr. Seradelgin. Uh, Dr. Spiro, do you want to say something? Unmute, um, unmute. Yeah. unmute, please. Unmute, unmute. Uh, I really agree with what you said. Ah. And don't forget that during this, uh, this period, we faced many, many problems with, uh, with, uh, with the social distance. And don't forget that one of the most important pillars for longevity is social, is socializing. And uh, I fully agree as an educator, as a professor of medicine, and also dealing so much with technology the last 16 years and working with, uh, with, uh, with technology, how to, how to decrease and how to, um, to delay um, the, cognitive de uh, uh, the cognitive decline of, uh, of uh, older adults. I had to understand a lot of things regarding stress and anxiety and depression during this, this pandemic. Uh, uh, month. So, and regarding the students, um, of course, the digital uh, the digital world is a very very useful one because also medicine is 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 uh, uh, very dynamic in the field of artificial intelligence and using technology. We know all of that, and we are hardly working on that. 
And, uh, but it's true that socialization and uh, respecting these four pillars that I've been talking before about longevity is essential for our health and for our independent living. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Uh, uh, going back um, uh, to the topic of uh, sustainable development, uh, uh, Dr. Borbeli, uh, could you tell us uh, how decision-making factors can um, uh, constitute a catalyst for sustainable development? Uh, what uh, has been done uh, until now at a state level to achieve the United Nations Sustainable uh, Development uh, uh, Goals? Yes, um, <clears throat> just a, a short comment regarding uh, the topic of, uh, of education and how, how we prepare ourselves for the future. Uh, and uh, based on my experience, we have to, and uh, somebody mentioned from the panelists, we have to start from kindergarten, in my opinion, and of course from uh, from uh, at home to have a, a very clear position regarding these basic principles. And regarding the partnership between the governments and uh, education and other stakeholders, we have a, a very fruitful discussion with the Ministry of Education and uh, uh, we will have not a new curricula because we know very well about the Romanian curricula how, uh, how uh, big is and it's not uh, relevant to have a new curricula. But we will have some specialized materials from kindergarten until universities in a half a year. And uh, it's very important to have this holistic approach, this principal approach of what means sustainable development. That's why it's a basic document of this century, in my opinion, the Agenda 2030. Because the, for the first time, we have data, we have indicators, and we can put together these indicators to have, based on analysts, based on specialized people, to put on the table of the politicians what uh, has to done in different areas. And I am very glad that Minister and Mr. Rector Prikopi is here because I will tell him probably a very well known issue. Uh, when I started here with this department, I saw a banner here regarding an important project I realized uh, coordinated by the Secretary General of the Government and uh, Mr. Professor University, State of Nation. It's a platform with 113 indicators, uh, which was a very important project for three years. And now we uh, ask from the colleagues to put together our background documents and the State of Nation, which is now here at the Secretary General of the Government, to put together and to look which are the basic indicators, maybe to change some indicators, but regarding the platform that we will have in one year, not just for Romania, but for four years in this, uh, uh, this area, will be a very important tool in the hands of all the specialists. We will have all the docu documents regarding sustainable development, all the reports. Unfortunately, Mr. Jeffrey Sachs is not here, but he has a dashboard in each year with 160 uh, countries in which stage they are regarding the fulfillment of, uh, uh, of the indicators of uh, uh, basic regarding education, regarding health. So in my opinion, to come back to the uh, question of Mr. President Constantinescu, we, it's, it's crucial to have a dialogue and to have a very clear interinstitutional framework, not just for a webinar, not just for, and we have this 
protocol signed one or two weeks ago with Mr. President Konstantinescu Institute for Levant and Romanian government. And we will have, I hope, many uh, different, very important, uh, uh, this kind of uh, meetings, not just online. And for the last, uh, my comment, I am very, uh, uh, you know, linked to this uh, Rubik cube. You know this Rubik cube, yes? This Rubik cube, it's with the 17, uh, we write the 17 SDGs. And if you turn just for two, you know, very small uh, movement, is not functioning because some pieces, they are not in their place. So this is like our society. If we have no each, each part, if each piece of the society, health, education, infrastructure, uh, and other issues in her places will not function or will be uh, uh, a less functionable society. We have to put together, but we need all on the board. And that's why it's important to have this kind of meetings and uh, to look how we can put together the uh, experience of one university, uh, of those uh, institutions who can help us to, uh, to know more about our society for the future generations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Borbey. Uh, thank you for bringing up the idea of dialogue between institutions and the idea of creating an interinstitutional platform. Dialogue is very important in order to achieve something because that's the end goal of any dialogue to reach some sort of resolution. And we have another question from our attendees, which is focusing especially on what you have put out uh, so far, the idea of uh, creating this um, uh, dialogue to uh, bring together all the pieces, all the pieces of the Rubik Cube, the Rubik Cube all the pieces of the 17 um, SDGs. And the question that uh, is addressed to you, what would be the best way to persuade decision makers and policy makers who are also playing in the most critical and uh, shareholder uh, section because this is important in order to achieve inclusiveness. It is a very difficult question. Based on my experience, uh, during these three years, we, uh, we have organized about, uh, I don't know, more than 150 meetings and not just uh, apropos about, uh, about online. Uh, I hope that we will have also uh, physical contacts and, and meetings, not just online. It's very good to stay at home and to have these kind of meetings. But I like to see the eyes of those who are partners and to explain to them how important are to, uh, to feel each other, to have this positive energy, which is more difficult in online. But basically, regarding the dialogue, uh, now we have a data network of more than uh, 2,500 people from different areas. And we have a newsletter in each month. We, uh, we uh, communicate them, which are the main uh, proposed and how they can help us. We, we want to collect their uh, opinions. But very important is how the institutions will answer. So that's why we established so-called hubs in each ministry, not on the level of politicians, because the politicians, you know, uh, Secretary of State's ministers, they are uh, for four years or less, because I, uh, I am now the fourth prime minister in, in uh, in four years and uh, each of prime minister during this period uh, uh, give me a green light. It's very interesting. It's a consensus now. It's very difficult to have a consensus on the political life of Romanian society, but it was a consensus regarding, regarding the issue of implementation of Agenda 2030. We have to continue on this. And that's why 
uh, we establish this uh, dialogue. Uh, we will have an actual plan. In a couple of months, we will finalize an action plan regarding all the 17 SDGs. We will have this consultative council, as I mentioned earlier, with 34 uh, important personalities in Romania who are involved on this uh, uh, Agenda 2030. We will have different committees, and I hope that we, they will be workable, so not just to uh, meet each other and, uh, and uh, to nothing happens in the future. So, uh, yes, it's very difficult to have this kind of dialogue, but uh, we need a position of this department near the Prime Minister's office to be a catalyst, catalysator, to be catalyst of different issues, to ask ministers to come uh, to the same uh, table and discuss uh, uh, issues and, of course, to have credibility and, uh, and uh, uh, region, regional performances. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Borberi. Dr. Seradelji, uh, the team of globalization took center stage from the outset of the pandemic. We have uh, entered an age of globalization and trade, but uh, there are many voices now uh, uh, wanting to roll back uh, this development. Why is that? Well, the uh, economists will uh, uh, tell you that uh, trade is beneficial for everybody, uh, but that is not quite true. Uh, it is uh, beneficial, uh, yes, uh, and uh, there are winners and losers in every society. Uh, but what to, they meant was that, in fact, the amount of the positive gains uh, in that society uh, is enough to compensate the losers. But that has not happened. In fact, if you look over the last 35 to 40 years, we have had more and more people uh, uh, left behind. We have had more and more people uh, who are uh, at the bottom of the barrel. So in the US, for example, if you look from 1980 till uh, 2020, you will see that the, the bottom 50% of the country used to receive 20% of the income. Now they receive around 10 to 11%. Uh, while the top 1% of the country used to receive 10% in 1980 and now receive over 20% of the total income. So that the top 1% is more than twice the bottom 50% of the country. So yes, they could have compensated the losers, but they didn't. So there was a major uh, uh, reaction in most of the countries of the West and we have seen the rise of uh, what we refer to vaguely as populism and nationalism and so on. But the last aspect of the COVID uh, pandemic has shown also that the integrated supply line, the just-in-time management that we used to talk about in the 1980s and 90s, has resulted that all of a sudden, uh, even countries, uh, as, as uh, well advanced as the United States uh, cannot get certain types of uh, medical instruments because parts of it are being done in China and parts are being done in Vietnam and parts are being done somewhere else. And all of a sudden you're getting this kind of return to a nationalism saying, make it here inside the boundaries of my country. So three separate problems. Problem number one, those who were left behind and who incidentally uh, have been among the primary uh, voters of Mr. Trump in 2016, that he was able to tell them, you have been forgotten, I will not forget you. That was one group. Second uh, group is a fear of the dilution of the production systems and uh, the desire to have a greater buffer stocks inside the countries themselves. And the third group that is also anti-globalization uh, has been 
a tremendous concern about the fact that the most powerful countries are going to dilute the cultural identities of various countries that are smaller countries and that you will lose some of that uh, uh, in their inability to manifest themselves. So all of these are posing questions. But we also have something totally new, which is technology is creating new kinds of globalization. So globalization is not just like the Kennedy round and the Uruguay round and the unsuccessful Doha round where the WTO members all negotiate for years and then sign agreements for all the countries. That's one type of trade negotiations that used to exist. We now have new realities created by the companies themselves who have supply lines that are uh, uh, spread throughout the world and who uh, they have created some kind of a bottom up uh, uh, type of globalization by connecting with suppliers from all over the world and with distributors all over the world as well. I mean, it's, it's kind of uh, interesting that Apple um, is, <laughs> produces mostly in China and sells a lot in China, as well as a time when there is all these tariff battles going on. So I think that we need to revisit the notion of globalization and trade and to look at how technology, and I can, that's a, that's a huge topic in and of itself, but how technology is enabling us, partly through ICT and communication, but also through everything from the spread of seeds and varieties of uh, food. I mean, uh, now there's hardly any food that you cannot find in, in a supermarket, regardless of the season uh, that you are in. So there's a, there are all sorts of different kinds of things, transport, communications, et cetera, where uh, the, the technology is also making a new kind of globalization. Now, can we, in fact, say, let us recognize our common humanity. I mean, after all, the United Nations was formed, we the peoples of the United Nations. It doesn't say we the nations, it says we the peoples. And, uh, and the Charter therefore recognizes our common humanity. Can we go for an inclusion of the poorest of the world along with us in a sustainable development pattern? Because we now learn whether it is from the, the, the pandemic or from climate change, that what happens in one part of the planet is impacting on other parts of the planet and we need to work together. That imaginative new proposal, it's a new form of multilateralism that we need to reinvent for the 21st century. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarah Dejin. Uh, in spite of uh, debates uh, surrounding uh, globalization usefulness, it has also accelerated the development of new technology. And uh, today, uh, technology is omnipresent and they're, I say, indispensable to any field, especially to healthcare. Uh, Dr. Spiro, at uh, the Anaslan International Academy, uh, you are undertaking pioneering work in the field of gerontotechnology and science in order to develop a process of active and uh, independent aging. How do these efforts correlate to the broader picture of sustainable development uh, of our societies? Thank you, Mr. President. I'm very happy that you launched this debate uh, during this, uh, this, uh, this meeting. Um, as, a, um, as a researcher, but a medical doctor as well, um, I've been created the Anasa International Academy Foundation in the early 2000 and uh, continuously for 20 years um, I, I'm coordinating European projects and uh, beginning with the early 2004 uh, we have been launched and we, we developed um, and we have been beginning to test and working in multidisciplinary teams innovative solutions for the, for the older adults as we call now. Um, it's true that in the very beginning it was quite difficult because being a medical doctor working in this field, it's not very easy to deal with, uh, with uh, technology and uh, with, uh, um, um, let's say, uh, engineers, specialists in IT or um, uh, artificial intelligence. And this is what we do. 
uh, right now. And um, during, during all these years, we, we, uh, we made a great progress in testing and designing also the profile of the end user of the, of the older uh, adult profile for these new technologies. Um, is in fact uh, we've been presented almost every year in the in the European forums our experience because today we are considered to be top five in Europe um, among the most important organizations medical organizations um, making research in this field and um, uh, speaking about using technology and um, trying to delay pathological aging and especially pathological brain aging by delaying the cognitive decline, which is, which is our specialty because uh, we own an excellent center for Romania in the field of memory diseases and longevity medicine under the auspices of the European Alzheimer's disease. Um, I don't think that this is something very easy to be done. On contrary, uh, working in a multidisciplinary team and going step by step by uh, trying in the last, uh, uh, let's say, uh, seven years to use technology, especially for the independent, independent living, older adults, so living at home, um, it, is not, it was not very easy. So we, we can share uh, today our experience and we are doing, as I said before, every almost every two years in the European Commission and um, at the top management of the European Commission for the Innovative Solutions, and uh, some of them, uh, some of them, uh, some of these conclusions are based on how you organize this work. First of all, uh, being an, an expert organization, um, we we were we were very very many times asked why are we successful. First of all, because we have a multi medical multidisciplinary team. And um, then we respect the methodological guidelines and we create new guide, uh, guidelines adapted according to the European standards. And we also develop this, this uh, European standards almost every four years. Um, we have a long history of training and certification as an organization for, for, for integrated education. We've been trained more than, more than uh, 5,000 uh, 5, uh, doctors and uh, even equal nurses. Um, we have the access to a huge database of thousands of patients and caregivers and uh, hospital centers. But, but how we succeeded to apply our expertise in, the, in, the, um, in this uh, technological project in using technology, not only in, in assisted uh, ambient living projects, but uh, assisted and um, um, creating and also designing uh, the profile of the end user for these technologies. Because we used to, to use adequate assessment uh, tests. We also we always quantify um, the benefit of technology by measuring the improvement in scores. Uh, then we we implemented the educational stereotype of learning through repetition with the with the older adults, which is essential. And uh, we succeeded to to secure permanent assistance um, dedicated to the resource contact point. Um, and uh, there is a paradigm that we were hardly trying to uh, to remove from the from the from the old adult um, end user that they are testing, not them are being tested, which is essential if you want to if you want to be successful, you have to persuade an old adult to test technology and not to give him the feeling that is tested. And not finally, we are using, uh, we are very much based on preventive on, for pre-medicine, which is prevention, prediction, personalized and participation medicine. And um, uh, sharing all this expertise uh, for, for the last, uh, let's say 16 years, um, it's not the last uh, to involve uh, stakeholders um, in, um, in this process of define, defining the requirements of the, of the, of the elder, older adults who, who test this, uh, the technology. 
Uh, also, we dedicated uh, events uh, for the attraction and the recruitment of, uh, of primary end user or secondary end users. And this is how we succeeded to create a very strong network uh, between uh, the patients organization all over Europe and also internationally now, because I'm very proud to, to, to say and to mention that among the 22 European successful projects in the field of using technology, um, we also coordinate uh, two very large projects, uh, European projects in the field of, uh, of uh, elaborating new guidelines of, by, uh, for using technology indoor and outdoors. And uh, this is essential and, uh, and um, uh, not, uh, not uh, at least, but not the last. Um, there, of course, there are very, very many challenges. Some of you are experts. In, in trading and in finance. And uh, we've, we've, uh, we've got many times the question about why these products are not always uh, on the market, are, are not so visible on the market. And um, the problem is that the mentality of, uh, of developing and selling these kind of products is not yet um, uh, approved and um, understood correctly including as a business model for, for those who are putting this on the market. And uh, this is essential for this kind of products. But I think, I think um, uh, because we are here to, to debate uh, the new sustainable development, the global sustainable, sustainable development for, for, the, for, for the next 10 years, I think that was, this is one of the most important challenges for, um, for companies, for investors, for startups, to, uh, to invest in this kind of, uh, of products, because I'm sorry for that, but, but we cannot separate today um, modern medicine from technology and artificial intelligence. Um, again, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, regarding, the, uh, regarding the technology, this is our experience and I'm very happy to share with you. And uh, uh, we also coordinate one of the largest projects right now in Romania. And we are we are um, uh, setting up 1,000 homes, apartments in Bucharest and Ilfov with technology. And the role of it, the project name is Smart Bear, and the role of it is to is to get informations without any effort from the from the independent older adults to collect information, information, clinical information about the diabetes level, the heart rate. Um, the acoustic problems, um, the cognitive um, disorders, the frailty, I mean, the risk of falling and so on. So uh, it's, uh, it's very challenging, but it's wonderful to work with technology uh, in this uh, very modern era. So this is our experience and I'm very happy to share it with you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Spiro. That is a very impressive work that you're doing at the uh, Academy and all this uh, intertwining between technology, individuals, medicine, education, training, training the trainers, because you said, uh, you mentioned the idea of uh, working and uh, training professionals. And um, the, the, our viewers are uh, particularly interested in what you are doing. And we have a question regarding the, uh, the connection between between technology and the individual, because you've been speaking about uh, this through the programs that you are pioneer pioneering at the uh, Naslan International Academy. And uh, our question focuses on the fact that technology is crossing borders, even uh, during pandemic. But how, however, during the pandemic, we've had a major issue because borders were closed, except for essential goods. However, um, April Ripley, who is uh, asking the question, is stating that essential goods are also so shouldn't be human beings also considered essential goods, then how should uh, we deal with um, the need to connect technology and human beings during the pandemic, during a pandemic in this context of closed borders? How did you deal with the idea of closed borders? Because I'm sure you have uh, foreign partners and you have um, um, uh, associates, uh, professionals, foreign professionals working together in the projects that you're developing. How did you cope with this uh, situation, focusing on technology, focusing on artificial intelligence, the ones that you are using? and last but not least and probably the most important focusing on the very individuals that you're both approaching from a professional side 
and also from uh, the target side, the, the people that you are trying to, to, to work with, cure, produce uh, medicine and so on, and provide strategies for, their, um, for helping them. It is true. It is true. I, first of all, I'm a clinician, so I'm a professor of medicine, and I'm I'm a practitioner. I'm I'm not only a researcher, so I'm a researcher, a practitioner, and um, also and also a trainer and uh, an educator. Um, during the during the during the pandemic, it was quite difficult because we had we had many many serious problems regarding our our um, old adults, older adults. Uh, first of all, uh, were our patients, our outpatients, who were uh, continuously asking for, for, for advices and who were not able to reach the hospitals because most of the hospitals was, were blocked because of, the, because of the emergencies regarding the COVID-19. Uh, the second segment were, uh, was about our inpatients who were at home or they have been sent to residential uh, houses and the third um, and the third category were, were were older adults who never have been our patients in or out patients and who are continue and during this period we have been already we have been asked many many questions emails uh, phone calls about what they should do during the pandemic this is why during the pandemic I accepted to <clears throat> to have a twice uh, twice a week uh, uh, direct uh, TV program and to meet the questions and answer direct of all the all the persons who who, who saw me and I always had an invited uh, an, uh, a guest from from my team to debate all their problems and I have to tell you now after two months and a half that the most important questions um, regarding that isolation time were related to anxiety, to the lack of privilege sitting with the family. Um, the question related to related to, to, to diabetes, to oscillation of the blood pressure, so cardiovascular uh, uh, risk problems and problems. But most of all, it was the isolation, the social isolation, which was really a problem. So if I have to quantify now how many questions were about anxiety, depression, uh, more than 85% were related to that. So it was a huge experience because during this, uh, during this sessions, direct session that I, 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 I was, I've been asked to, to, to do, uh, we had more than 60,000 visioners or uh, active people reaching this, uh, uh, this um, 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 meetings, uh, weekly meetings. Regarding the technology, it was very useful because without technology, we couldn't have this dialogue. Most of them, they were, they were trained by their, by their family. Some of them were our volunteers. Some of them were our patients or our inpatients, outpatients. But the most important is the use of technology during this pandemic. Uh, time, and uh, they were very happy, and most of, and some of them discovered for the first time the use of technology. And uh, don't forget that, as I told you before, we are we are used to work with technology for at least sixteen years, and to test technology and to design the profile of the end user of new technologies. So I think without technology today, um, uh, we we feel this social isolation much, much deeper if we, if we didn't have access to it. And um, that doesn't mean that technology should, should uh, replace um, what is essential in our, in our life. I mean, social living, spirituality, um, let's say tradition, um, exchange of opinion, all these kind of very important things, which are essential also for longevity. So, from my point of view, now because we are working, we are we are we are working the last two years to develop artificial intelligence solutions for prevention, because this is why artificial intelligence is useful in in medicine, and not only, it's to have as many tools to prevent 
and to, and to, and to have uh, early reactions before the disease appears. In fact, this is, this is the, the state of the art in medicine. The early intervention before the disease is set on. So uh, fortunately, we have to give technology uh, the recognition uh, it, it, it's needed, but also to, um, to understand that without, without the expertise of setting up all this information and putting them together into, into a holistic way, as, as the professor um, uh, Barberi says before, uh, it's essential because we need, we need to train more and more doctors in a very holistic and integrative way uh, in, in, order to, in order to understand what longevity is and how important it is to have early interventions after 40, after the, years, the, the, the age of 40, this is, I, this is if we speak ide idealistically about this. So as soon as we can do things, this is, this is very, very welcome. There is no secret. In fact, there is no pill for longevity. Everything is based on prevention, education, knowledge, interest, participation, and a lot of a lot of research and um, uh, implication in this kind of and of course vocation because medicine without vocation it's um, it's not so spectacular as <laughs> as we would like to. Uh, thank you. Uh... Dr. Spiro, um, Dr. Saradilji. Yes, thank you. I wanted to uh, pick up on what Dr. Spiro said because research uh, uh, and medical research particularly is extremely important right now. Uh, and specifically that there's enormous variability between countries around the world. Yes, we have a common enemy in uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, and the COVID-19, but nevertheless, uh, there's uh, uh, each country has its own specificities in terms of family structures, in terms of deployment of uh, urban and rural environments, et cetera, et cetera, and the quality of healthcare as well. So in fact, a number of, uh, of us are involved uh, with the European uh, Center for Molecular Biology and Dr. Charles Lofray and others. We are making proposal, in fact, it's being hopefully published in in uh, the Lancet, uh, um, maybe in the coming issue, where uh, we need to make sure that there are a series of uh, studies that will look at the genotypical and phenotypical aspects related to the patient pool uh, under the same protocols. And if we can uh, have a systematic agreement beforehand uh, with everybody doing the studies that they are doing on their populations or, or subsets of their population, uh, samples, uh, sample size and everything that we can agree on and the protocols and the, the, the prior consent and so on, then we can have a much better chance of comparing and understanding uh, the information that is coming out and the data and the methodology will be better understood because uh, we have had a, a couple of months uh, in these last six months where uh, data was coming and going from all over the world and nobody could really compare this with that. And, and uh, so the ability of saying, let us at least, we're here for the long haul, can we uh, perhaps not necessarily collaborate, let each country do its own piece, but let us have more or less certain uh, minimum standards that can be applied then you will have a, a capacity for institutions like WHO or others to participate in pulling together that data sets, which becomes much bigger data sets and where we can in fact look for variability as well as commonalities and uh, open a new chance for another round of scientific research that will hopefully help us developing better technologies as well. Thank you. Thank you. In order to create um, uh, effective healthcare and educational system, uh, we must integrate them in a developmental model. Uh, Dr. Yes. Seradergi, uh, what is uh, the prevalent model for development today in, in advanced countries? 
in relation to that of the developing world. Should these models overlap, uh, integrate, or separate altogether? Oh, wow. That, uh, Mr. President, you have hit uh, one of the biggest and most profound questions that we have today. Uh, I think we would all agree that uh, the uh, notion of one size fits all, uh, that you have a single model and that it applies to everybody is not uh, the right way to go because every society is different. Its challenges are different, both in terms of the natural challenges, uh, the environment uh, in which people live, the kinds of cities, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is very different. But at the same time, we can share the same goals. And that's why we have the sustainable development goals. Yes, we want to reduce inequality. How much, where is gonna happen is going to be different in, in every country, but we have a number of indicators. So the 17 sustainable development goals, we have 160 plus indicators which are grouped in different ways. Uh, and we have different dashboards to, to look at each country and to look at all these goals together and separately. And I think that uh, the development models that we'll have are very different. Now, there are, right now we are caught in a particular situation. The rich countries and primarily the richest countries, the United States, Europe, uh, Europe, I'm thinking of the Eurozone in particular, uh, the, the British with the sterling pound and the Japanese with the yen, in fact, uh, have a situation where they can uh, uh, do quantitative easing or printing money. They can uh, expand very significantly the availability of credit to their citizens. And uh, the scale of interventions, both in Europe and in the United States, where, I mean, it's over uh, three trillion in one and uh, almost one and a half, two trillion in the other, uh, trillion, trillion dollars. Uh, you know, when you start saying, well, let's compare that, how does that compare to countries like uh, Togo and Benin uh, in West Africa, small countries, poor countries, etc., or even large countries, but still poor countries like Nigeria, uh, you have a, a situation where I think the types of questions are very different. I would imagine that in the developing world, we absolutely need uh, much greater uh, government intervention. And we need it now, and we need it to, to, for a preventative as well as a, a proactive form. And that this is an opportunity, in fact, to expand the outreach, to expand the outreach, and we will hopefully have a vaccine, I hope, but uh, uh, even if we, we have treatments, uh, we need testing, we need treatments, we need vaccines, and therefore a, a huge expansion of the healthcare, uh, outreach systems of healthcare, much as we will also need immediately a huge expansion of the agricultural research system, because the poorest countries that rely on rainfall uh, are going to see uh, huge variations in rainfall because of climate change. So you have one year flood, one year drought that will have problems of availability of food. And uh, that requires the intervention of government right now. These systems are not as well established uh, uh, in the poorest countries as they are in the rich countries. And I would think that we also need, and I would make an appeal right now, we must reduce, uh, postpone, not just postpone, but actually significantly reduce the debt burden of the poorest countries. It is unthinkable that in the midst of everything that is going on right now, whether it is uh, health or it is food security, uh, countries like Sub-Saharan Africa have to pay back to the rich countries of the world $44 billion. I mean, come on, <laughs> this is, uh, not sensible. We are going towards another debt crisis. We saw several of those uh, before, uh, but I think you know if you, why wait until we reach the the cliff and start going over the cliff before we say, oh my God, we need to change the rules right now. Let us anticipate where we are going. Let us imagine and design together new approaches that can help these people help themselves in order to deal with health. Food security, nutrition, 
essential uh, uh, aspects of that kind, as well as education, but that's another discussion as well. Um, thank you. Uh, turning to Rector Prikopje, I wondered uh, what uh, your talks were on the role of academic community plays uh, in the process of shaping uh, public policy. Uh, do you think uh, it should be more prominent, less, or is it currently at an adequate level? Professor Constantinescu, I will answer with the words of the former president of Romania, President Constantinescu. When he was in the position of president, he invited academics to be part of the government to take over uh, different very difficult position and based on their expertise and credibility as ministers, as prime minister, as politicians to invite other academics and experts in their field to contribute to the development of Romania. Probably uh, 25 years, 24 years ago, when you decided to act this way, it was the moment when the future of Romania was uh, shaped, the future of, of Romania as member of NATO and member of uh, European Union. Uh, but uh, besides this specific example, I would like to say the biggest policy ever in the history of the world designed by academics and assumed by politicians is Agenda uh, 2030, Sustainable Development Goals. We all know very well the history of this process, which started before 2000, somehow I would say it started uh, in the uh, 60s with uh, different reports of academics, the Club of Rome and so on. And this uh, Sustainable Development Goal 17 were designed by experts, by specialists, negotiated by diplomats and approved by head of states and government. And related to this, I remember I was in um, some um, meetings and uh, a lot of people disappointed <coughs> university meetings with the fact that education is not well represented and sustainable development goals and uh, we have just um, uh, higher education especially, uh, not education as generally. We have just um, uh, one objective about uh, equity and access in education and higher education is not there. And I remember I asked for the floor and I said higher education is everywhere. Because if we speak about uh, gender equity, if we speak about health, if we speak about um, as was mentioned, uh, uh, environment, any, any topic from sustainable development goals, it's a topic which has the roots in higher education and it will be implemented if experts and higher education and research institutes will uh, contribute. And I'm very happy and grateful, uh, Minister Borbelli mentioned a very a milestone project for our university, the State of the Nation, which uh, was uh, initiated by the government through the Secretary uh, General of the government. And uh, I'm happy this project uh, has outcomes which will help uh, 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 Romania to monitor and to reach these objectives in uh, the near future. So the answer is yes. Academia has different ways of um, uh, shaping policies from simple uh, public positions, you know, expressing their opinion as experts to a more complicated involvement, research, uh, education activities, uh, policy um, uh, proposals involved in the policy design process because it is a difference between a proposal in the design process, assessment, and so on. In fact, is what uh, in my university 
which has a long name, National University of Political Studies and Public Administration, but a short acronym, SNSPA, is what uh, the university where uh, uh, I have worked for the last uh, 25 years has done since we were established. And again, Professor Constantinescu signed documents of the establishment of this university while he was rector at Bucharest University. And uh, as you very well know, many today standard policies somehow were catalyzed in this university, like um, the law of uh, access to public information. So, or the, uh, we are speaking about uh, public policies. The first master program in public policy was accredited in SNSPA. Gender issues, which is discussed today, we started with a master program on this topic in 1998. In fact, Mihaila Miroyu started this program. Uh, and many, many other uh, um, evidence-based policies. Another topic developed during the uh, years. And also, we are happy to go further with some examples from um, uh, SNSPA. Many of the politicians are in uh, they graduated SNSPA, and you can see from their discourse, uh, they practically have assumed um, different theories, and now they are trying to uh, implement. And also, uh, because it was discussed about transdisciplinarity, not just in this session, but also in other session, in our university, we are focused more on master program, postgraduate activities, and there are many people, many students who have already uh, an excellent career. Uh, I'm looking at uh, uh, Dr. Spiro, many medical doctors already established and not willing to change their profession as medical doctors. They come to us in order to acquire the policy skills or the managerial skills in order you know, to better understand what uh, a medical doctor can do in order to promote uh, public health policies and so on. And this is not just uh, in the sector of, so this transdisciplinary approach is present um, uh, here. Um, also our debate is uh, drawing to a close. I am nevertheless eager to discuss uh, the steps um, each of our respective fields uh, might take in the future to facilitate uh, the elaboration and implementation of global governments. Uh, Dr. Seradelgin, uh, how will uh, the pandemic and the emerging economy trends impact the design, uh, development, and the distribution of global governance uh, in the 21st century. In the 21st century, Mr. President, is a, is a long uh, time horizon. Uh, I, I think uh, that um, uh, we have really uh, three separate problems to look at. Uh, in the very short term, uh, we have disruptive forces uh, both inside Europe and uh, in uh, the United States, uh, in certain countries, uh, there is a, uh, or even in other countries as well, a return to authoritarianism, a return towards a, uh, a vision of uh, nationalistic populism uh, that is not very conducive towards uh, what is the second uh, force that we are dealing with, which is how to strengthen multilateralism, where nobody dictates to everybody else, or one person can dictate, but rather where we can reach consensus uh, through existing platforms, mechanisms, and institutions. Uh, that, after all, was the hope that we had in establishing the United Nations, where the indiv individual state is still the, the basic building block of the international legal system, but nevertheless, there was an effort made to try to reach consensus. But the design was made uh, reflecting the realities of 1945, uh, the uh, five Security Council uh, uh, veto countries uh, uh, were the victors of, uh, of uh, the Second World War. 
uh, they do not reflect necessarily the reality of the world today. So we've tried to create new mechanisms from the G7 to the G20, uh, and we've tried to find another way of bringing uh, uh, this consensus decision-making together. But uh, we need to go back and redesign the system bottom up. Because as I mentioned earlier on trade uh, that was seen by everybody in the 80s and 90s to be something extremely beneficial to everybody is now not seen to be that beneficial. And the fact that there is a disagreement on the priorities for implementation of some of our major things like how much do you uh, limit the action uh, of um, pollution and so on as a result of uh, uh, industry, industrialization and energy uh, consumption, uh, while at the same time recognizing the need for uh, long-term sustainability. Uh, I believe that um, whether it's on the environmental side, whether it's on the trade side, whether it's on the multilateral side, technology will have a great deal to, to do. And science, of course, is what drives technology. And I'm going to make a very radical statement, but I am willing to defend it. And the radical statement is that every single benefit that has come to humanity in the last 400 years has come because of science. I mean, categorically, just think the hardship under which people were producing meager conditions to live in 300 years ago and how all of that has been transformed uh, is there. Science is advancing very rapidly. And science, incidentally, Mr. President, is setting the tone. The scientific community is the only fully unified global community. All the scientists of the world work together. Something goes on in, in Brazil, we know about it in Canada, we know about it in, in Romania, we know about it in Egypt. In a matter of days, we have uh, inter-academy systems and networks that connect people together. We've been connecting the social sciences and the natural sciences. There is a system whereby doesn't matter who it is who puts it out, uh, it's the content, not the person or their gender or their nationality or the, the God they choose to worship. Doesn't matter. What matters is the content. And look, we just had retractions from uh, The Lancet and from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, recently uh, because there is a systematic approach in science that enables this. So the scientific community is really setting the tone. It is setting the tone by showing the world we can have a common language and we have a marvelous set of values that we want other people to adopt. Our number one value in science is truth. Anybody who fabricates data is rejected. The second value is honor. Anybody who plagiarizes other people is also rejected. The third value is creativity. We look for imaginative new solutions that change the paradigm. And there we have an engagement with the contrarian view and a willingness, and that's very important. We have a, a willingness to engage with the, the different view and a constructive subversiveness. We do not respect Newton less because Einstein changed our vision of uh, matter and uh, dimensions of space and time. Uh, we respect them both and we anticipate the next transformation because that's how science advances. And above all, we have a system for arbitrating disputes, which is based on evidence and logical argument. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody else adopted the same principles? Uh, for, um, for the remaining 10, 10 minutes of this debate, uh, I have uh, uh, some uh, brief questions. Uh, please answer in three minutes uh, each. Uh, Dr. Spiro, uh, in order to build uh, global governance, uh, we must, uh, above all, remain in good health. Uh, how do we simultaneously manage 
both uh, COVID-19 and uh, ageism uh, having older adults uh, on stage. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it, uh, during the last two months, uh, thank you, pre Mr. President, during the last two months, we, we, we've been faced a, a, a very difficult situation regarding the older adults who were, who were look like uh, the sitting ducks, vulnerable and uh, helpless against uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, there were high mortality rates among uh, among the, um, the elderly, among the older adults, and that was considered as inevitable and normal as a normal outcome of a pandemic. Um, it's uh, this is not only very true. Of course, we have to protect we have to protect our older adults. But also, uh, healthy younger adults may perceive themselves as invulnerable to, uh, to COVID-19. And um, it's true that uh, you, all of you, you, uh, you you've seen how uh, strong countries, of, uh, in, industrialized countries like, uh, like uh, UK, like uh, France, Italy, they had problems regarding uh, this, uh, this COVID problem with the old adults. Um, it's true that um, we also noticed that during this, uh, this uh, uh, entirely ageism period, the intergenerational solidarity, and this was a very, a very huge plus, because despite the, this clear indication that we've noticed as, as, as uh, geriatricians and gerontologists, there are also, we're also encouraging signs of, uh, of intergenerational solidarity during the pandemic. And there were so many thousands, hundreds of thousands of examples of younger people supporting older adults during the isolation. And all this, uh, all this uh, uh, led to to few conclusions. And the conclusion is, first of all, is that ageism doesn't have anything with the COVID. It's, it has to be a protective way to, um, for, the, for the older adults, but not an, an, um, an ageism attitude. And um, it's also uh, everything happened is a source of generational knowledge and wisdom. What happened in these two months and a half, and everything that happened uh, can contribute to the to the uh, to the um, workforce in increasing number, volunteers, and the threats of our economies and our families. In spite of all these difficulties during the pandemic. And uh, we cannot afford to be careless. This is this is true about about all these lost lives uh, because the ageist attitudes. And I I just want to highlight this because uh, we need to consider what we stand to lose if we let ageism to influence how we discuss and treat the older adults. And uh, for us, this is really essential because we care about every life because this is why we are medical doctors. Thank you. Um, Dr. Borbeli, uh, how might uh, your and similar other departments for sustainable development uh, contribute to fostering a constructive relationship with the academic milieu uh, in order to facilitate an open and transparent dialogue between governments and academic, uh, both in the context uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, beyond? Uh, we have already a very active uh, partnership with the uh, academic area. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Seregedin uh, not mentioned a very important, uh, and it was a brilliant speech of him, the last one, and not just the last one, solidarity. Yes, we need solidarity. Without solidarity, it will be not possible to uh, solve the issue of COVID-19 and other issues. So we have already, we have a questionnaire uh, of, uh, um, completed by all the universities of Romania. We have a new job in Romania, yeah. expert in uh, sustainable development. Now we finalize to have a consultancy on this to prepare for the uh, end of the year, how we will prepare this for this new job, expert on uh, sustainable development, young people. Uh, we have an inventory of all the masterats and all the 
uh, in universities in which states they are. So, in my opinion, it will be very important to be together. But I see a very well-known friend of us, Mr. Jeffrey Sachs, here. He is with us, Mr. President Constantinescu. Ah, Jeff. <laughs> Mr. Jeff. Ah, hi. Mr. President, uh, thank, thank you, uh, Laszlo. And Mr. President, I apologize. I was uh, battling uh, entry into, uh, in, in, into the conference. Uh, I just didn't have the right password for a long time. So uh, I know I'm at the very end, but I wanted to greet you and thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, to participate and inviting me to participate. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Um, the main questions for you was what are the institutional institutional framework in uh, in which global governance can be applied. Thank you very much. Uh, if I could answer that uh, in a roundabout way. But briefly, starting with uh, Ismail's uh, uh, also uh, brilliant remarks about uh, the, the norms uh, and uh, values of science. Uh, unfortunately, the scientific community, uh, as wonderful as is and as much as we uh, subscribe to its values, doesn't have the full set of values that we need, uh, which I would add uh, mercy, justice, and the common good. Uh, which are not especially values of the scientific community. Uh, not that they're antithetical in, in any way, but uh, the norms of science, uh, which are the seeking of truth, are not the same as the norms of uh, the seeking of the good uh, and, uh, and well-being, which is really at the core of what we're after. I do believe that what we are witnessing in the differential response to this epidemic is partly the response to science and partly the values proposition. Uh, it is not a coincidence. I'm sad to say that America has 115,000 deaths and a psychopathic president. Uh, this is a, a values question. Uh, Trump does not care. He reflects a, a movement that does not care. Part of his constituency is exactly what Dr. Spiro was uh, reacting to, uh, actually literally saying it is the responsibility of old people to die so that young people can go about their daily lives. Uh, stupid and hideous at the same time. Uh, so we really need to uh, grapple with this values question. Uh, many of the leaders in the world right now that are in runaway pandemic countries are leaders with profoundly flawed values and movements of very flawed values. I would put Trump on the top of this, but I would also uh, put uh, Bolsonaro, for example, as another case of a country with a runaway pandemic because of an ideology that is absolutely disturbing. Uh, and uh, we need to face this. This is partly the pathologies of individuals that come to power. And it is partly the ideologies uh, of greed that are uh, pervasive and that need to be fought head on, actually. Uh, Thanks God, uh, Romania is doing a vastly better job of controlling this pandemic. And I hope uh, that uh, and pray that you continue to be able to do so. Uh, we need the values uh, that uh, Ismail uh, rightly championed of truth and, and of universality. We also need uh, the basic value of compassion and the common good and the at the universal level, uh, this is expressed in the moral charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the idea that every person on the planet has dignity and human value and human rights, including the right to life. And uh, if something good comes out of this epidemic, and 
that could be the case, but it's not guaranteed. If something good comes out of this epidemic, it will be a return to the basic moral principles that there are universal values, that they are reflected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that they are based on human dignity, and that they require uh, the realization of rights that have been on the books now for 72 years, but not realized until today. And I think that this is the critical point from my point of view. Everywhere I'm speaking, I'm emphasizing the dangers of the United States right now as a country that does not have these values uh, in hand in our power structure. Uh, but we need a global system that starts with the values. The UN was and is our best hope for that, but it absolutely needs renovation and strengthening right now. Wonderful. Uh, dear Jeffrey, uh, thank you for uh, the insight. I have uh, the last uh, uh, question for you. Um, the Aid Millennium uh, Development Goals in existence since uh, the year 2000 were replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. The original uh, eight joined by another nine for 17 objectives in total. The 2030 agenda for sustainable development forecast, somewhat uh, optimistically, in my opinion, that um, the SDGs will have been achieved in by uh, uh, 2030. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, given that uh, the number of targets increased from eight in 2000 to 17 in uh, 2015 which uh, only shows that uh, instead of identifying more solutions, we are identifying more problems. <laughs> uh, do you think that there is uh, any change of progress of uh, attenuating or diminishing the problems uh, expressed by each sustainable development goal in turn within um, uh, the next 10 years? Uh, thank you. Uh for wise uh, comment and, and uh, a good question. I think that uh, what uh, has happened if we look uh, historically, uh, every generation, uh, every decade, uh, in fact, uh, the UN has stated a new set of development goals. Uh, so uh, the MDGs were preceded by decades of development that have been uh, really the uh, global commitments since the 1960s. Every case of them is about realizing what we promised in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, because it's really all there. In the Universal Declaration, it says everybody on the planet has a right to health, has a right to food, uh, has a right to life, social protection, education, and so forth. Then it says in that document that these will be progressively realized. We are 72 years later, they have not been realized, though they could have been realized vastly sooner. What is the problem? The problem, of course, is not only are these goals not enforceable in any meaningful sense, but the rich and the powerful countries of the world have never taken them all that seriously as a obligation of responsibility towards the poorer and the weaker countries of the world. Each succeeding uh, instance of these goals, the problem became worse. I've been involved in this now for 40 years. The United States during that period went from the lead donor country to the greatest antagonist of the multilateral system during my career. Uh, it used to be a leader in development aid. Now Trump uh, cancels support for WHO at the height of the pandemic. He even puts sanctions on the International Criminal Court. He withdraws from the Paris Climate Agreement. He withdraws from uh, uh, other international 
uh, agreements, the Iran nuclear agreement. He puts unilateral sanctions on many countries that are crippling tens of millions of people. We became a rogue nation during this process. So we are not going to achieve the sustainable development goals on the current trajectory. It's not even possible uh, unless there was the will and responsibility to do this. And it, achieving these goals requires, first of all, goodwill. Uh, that means not fighting for power, but fighting for global solutions. This requires the powerful countries of the world to be working together not to be creating a cold war as the United States is trying to do with China right now, deliberately so, by the way, not because China is provoking it, but because the United States is afraid of the rise of China's technological and economic capacity. So it's trying to stop it, which is an absurd idea to try to stop one fifth of humanity from having uh, the benefits of modern technology. But that is what's going on. So what we need to learn from all of this is to absolutely uh, press for honest responsibility among the powers of this planet. It's a hard and uh, pretty uh, uh, thankless task, unfortunately, because they're not so prone to listen. Uh, but. I believe that we need to speak very clearly right now because we are in a grave danger on the planet, not only from the pandemic, but from the deliberate stirring of conflict, from the continuing nuclear arms race, the breaking of nuclear agreements, the, econ the environmental catastrophes. I hate to be so bleak about it, because all of these things are solvable if, we, uh, sub if, if Ismail's uh, values of truth would be upheld, if the scientific values of truth would be upheld and combined with the values of decency, compassion, uh, and uh, the sense of the common good. In other words, strangely enough, we're not so far from achieving everything we've said we want to achieve. But to achieve it, we have to try. And we're not trying right now among, uh, put it in the United States, we're not even trying to stay alive in the United States uh, from a public point of view. They're, they're ready to turn away from the thousands of deaths each week and not even care. That is our problem, Mr. President. How do we overcome this? You are a great leader, please advise us on what the solution to uh, this uh, very real geopolitical reality is. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Um, um, we now have uh, time for uh, one uh, last uh, question. Um, one necessary first step is to define the institutional framework of global governance. Uh, Rector Prikopie. Uh, what role can schools of government of political international uh, administrative studies uh, uh, play in elaborating new models of governance in the 21st century? And uh, what might uh, such uh, uh, models look like? May I uh, start uh, with uh, somehow a joke? Sometimes we have a very bad role. If we look in uh, mass media and read articles about our ideas, we conclude we are bad because uh, we uh, don't like the status quo. We don't like to sit uh, for years in the same model. And we challenge the politicians, institutions, society to move forward. So sometimes, uh, you know, our ideas, not just ideas that uh, are developed in school of government, but generally ideas from universities. We have many, many examples in the history of civilization, how great ideas were criticized, were bad. Um, I'm saying this because today in Romania, it is a big uh, discussion about uh, gender studies, if gender studies are good or bad. And uh, five universities initially in the morning said, uh, the parliament cannot interdict 
you know, to study topics like this. And after that, the National Council of, of Rectors issued that press release. Uh, so sometimes universities are considered uh, bad. But uh, besides this uh, uh, very specific uh, situation, I think what we should value and encourage is the debate and it's a discussion. Uh, not, not just among academics. Sure, we, as uh, Ismail said, the dialogue between academics probably is the most persistent dialogue through centuries. The first globalization was when universities started to develop and the academics and students to move uh, uh, around. So coming back and trying to answer shortly, I do believe we, if we say we have the answers, it's, it's wrong. We, 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 don't, we don't have to claim this. What we have to claim is we think we have the good questions and let's work together to find answers to these questions. And if we succeed to persuade all actors in the society and to work together to find answers and after that to try to implement I think we'll avoid many, many mistakes in, at the level of um, uh, society. And I do appreciate, and from the beginning, I have supported the idea of Professor Constantinescu to organize within this uh, conference of the World Academy of Art and Science, specific sessions, this one, the most uh, important with the role of academia in shaping the world. So congratulations, Professor Constantinescu, for having the idea and for being stubborn to push forward this idea and to transform the idea in uh, uh, this session. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank everyone, including our viewers, uh, for taking part uh, in this panel. Uh, the ideas uh, collected uh, as part of this broad and brainstorming debate uh, will be uh, contained in a report uh, that uh, will be forwarded to the United Nations Office in Geneva with um, a view to organizing an even more ample conference this fall. Uh, its uh, aim uh, will be uh, to collect uh, the catalytic solution presented uh, over uh, the course of our many panels and to elaborate a series of uh, programmatic documents uh, to serve uh, as a framework uh, for implementing new policies uh, across uh, essential economic and social uh, societal, uh, societal sectors uh, at the global level. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, Jeff. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>